So we were talking to somebody else on the podcast. I can't remember who, but they said that the original demo for Figma was just like a WebGL ball of water and that it somehow went from that to what we have today. So can you fill us in a little bit on that journey from ball of water to like design tool? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, honestly, I, I don't think I was there when that first ball of water was created, but I think what people are referencing is um, Evan, uh, who was the is the co-founder of Figma. Um, and was the CTO of Figma. Um, before uh, Dylan and Evan got started, Evan was doing a lot of prototyping with WebGL when it first came out. And Evan's a, a brilliant graphics programmer and he created this uh, this like uh, you know simplified fluid dynamic simulation uh, in WebGL with a ball that you could displace uh, you know a 2D fluid field on top of it. Um, and it was really cool. And I think it just gave people like a glimpse into what browsers were now capable of. And I think that's ultimately what gave Evan and Dylan even more confidence to pursue bringing a professional design tool into the browser, which way back when, like no one ever thought it would be possible, myself included. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm reminded of the time before Figma uh, when Sketch was the the primary design tool that like designers that I know interfaced with and, you know, native Mac app, they, they really sort of focused on performance and sort of this native quality as the thing that like really differentiates themselves. And, and that was, was important and valuable, but I think like the Figma team has shown that you can get performance and great good quality on the web. And also I think unlocked something else that's like really sort of set a different tone in the entire industry, which is like multiplayer and collaboration. That's now like the price of entry. So could you talk a little bit about your, your sort of like strategy, like technical strategy around like collaboration and like how y'all think about that internally? Yeah. Um, so I guess like first and foremost, like we, we, we always recognize that we're a professional tool. And I think when you're building professional tools, especially like tools that you live in eight hours a day, five days a week or more, um, every ounce of performance always matters. Uh, in particular, when you're kind of designing applications, you want to be able to look at a lot of different ideas and, and um, screens all at once. And so oftentimes like the level of performance you need for a design tool, or at least the performance characteristics you optimize for a design tool, um, are even uh, more advanced than what like you're actually going to need when you create the production application and only render a single screen at a time. Um, so we we knew from day one that we we had to care about performance, but we also felt like uh, the design process was a little bit broken. Um, we were still stuck in this kind of world of you know almost like print artifacts, like you know where you know you're, you're creating something and like you're literally shipping the result. Um, and you're just like embedding it into, you know, a newspaper or, you know, a, a simple static website or something like that. Um, and the reality is like design has become so much bigger than that in the context of building digital products. You're not actually even producing the end result. Oftentimes you're usually, you know, visualizing what the end result could be to help bring your team along in the line. Um, and so it's just inherently a much more collaborative and iterative process. And so we knew that we wanted to build um, an experience that really made it completely accessible to the entire team and, and got rid of all the friction that I think a lot of us were feeling um, back in the early uh, 2000s around, you know, having to go through this very kind of complex coordination process around handoff and, you know, trying to understand a lot of the, the intent of these, these mocks and designs and trying to keep track of how they're changing and what the right version of the file was and stuff like that. And so I think that you know, we made the decision to to bet on the web very early. Uh, and I think it turned out to be the right call. Uh, way back then, I think there were still a lot of people, even when I joined, that were second guessing whether or not we would be successful on the web. Um, to be honest, Figma wasn't always, uh, you know, super, super fast. We had a lot of different edge cases we had to like optimize for over the years as as our customers kept pushing us to our limits. Um, but I think we, we showed the team and we showed the world that um, even though there are some limitations to the abstractions that we build on on the web, those weren't um, the actual barriers to performance. There was ways to change the structure of the problems and the nature of the problems to work around those sort of relatively minor limitations in retrospect. Um, but yeah, ultimately, I think building for the web was like the strategy because uh, everyone knows how to share a URL. Um, we made sure that viewers were free so that you know you never had to worry about whether or not someone could view your file. Um, and it just made it that much easier to, to get everyone on the same page. and actually build an experience, not just for the, the professional designers, but also for all the other professionals that they're working with to bring their ideas to life. So speaking of web technologies, like, as you said, to build a product like Figma, you need a lot of things from the browser and those things 
were like either very new or just coming into existence when Figma was coming around. Uh, one of the things that you guys, I think are kind of famous for is like, you guys use Wasm in the browser, but, uh, I don't think many people know where like the line is on that. So like, how did you guys use Wasm and like, have you, have you used it in more and new interesting ways since then? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like a fun story. Um, so I think in the, in the very, very early days, uh, Wasm didn't exist. Um, and there was this thing called ASMJS, which is like this kind of subset of JavaScript that you could use that browsers like would run in a more Wasm like way, more like as if they're running some sort of virtual machine code. Um, but that had like, you know, its own set of limitations and wasn't as efficient as Wasm at the time. Um, so, and then WebGL was still like relatively nascent when I think the company was founded um, and, and also evolving. And so actually in the very early days of Figma, um, the team actually uh, built their own programming language to transpile uh, the application logic and the rendering logic to different platforms, including the web and also native to sort of hedge their bets. Um, but by the time I joined, it was pretty clear that those lower level browser APIs, even with ASMJS and just WASM, uh, or sorry, WebAssembly, not, not WebAssembly, WebGL at the time were sufficient to build a pretty compelling experience. And so by that time we went all in on the web and we kind of got rid of the, the transpilation step and the intermediate language and whatnot. But yeah, I mean, I think what, what ultimately happened is, um, uh, as we continued to kind of push the limits of the browser and other people in the game industry and, and other areas did as well, um, the, the people developing the browsers um, were also trying to like enable those sorts of new use cases on the web. Um, and we owe a lot of like credit to the teams, you know, at Firefox and Chrome and, and everywhere else that was, was pushing these limits. Um, but ultimately when Wasm came around, it wasn't that hard for us to just change our tool chain to compile to this new target and start to explore the potential there. Um, and so we did that really early on. And um, at first it actually had some trade-offs. Like uh, I think um, not all browsers were like caching the compilation artifacts. There was some additional initialization time required relative to what we'd been doing before. Um, but we worked with the companies um, who were developing these technologies who also happened to, to use our software. Um, and, uh, and you know, a lot of other people did too. And ultimately now it's like in a position where it works extremely well for our use case and we're very happy with it. But our use case is pretty unique. I don't think everyone needs to be using Wasm all the time. Um, it really depends on, on what you're trying to do and also like what other libraries you're trying to consume. So in our case, um, we consume a lot of the same lower level like um, font shaping libraries and, and whatnot that operating systems and browsers themselves consume. Um, and browsers didn't provide the right abstractions, and I don't think they still do, to directly access that type of font information. And so um, it's actually very, it's much easier for us to just consume those C++ libraries and then, you know, compile them to WASM than it is to, to rewrite them. So that's another motivation for it. Yeah, another big use case there was the plugins. Uh, I, I know that, like, originally when you were designing plugins for Figma, it's like a generally a hard problem if you have like a, a you know shared application that's like collaborative and you want people to run code on it without like you know a bunch of security issues. I think generally you're looking at realms. Uh, I'd sort of like read some of the early articles about like you know trying to build uh, the the plugin infrastructure. So it's like realms is like a way to like isolate JavaScript uh, and to, it's sort of like on realm or whatever. And it turns out that like that wasn't ready yet and they you know had like found some issues and ended up going to to wasm do you do you recall like much of that journey and like have you had learnings from the plugin e ecosystem so far yeah that, um yeah that was a really interesting time i think um like to your point i think a lot of people nowadays take it for granted that it's like totally possible to allow third-party developers to run uh, custom code inside of the same kind of web process that your application is running and not get access to sensitive data and whatnot um, or not totally screw up your application. Um, but uh, we knew that like we wanted to provide an extensibility model. Um, Sketch had a very vibrant plugin ecosystem at the time that we were developing and um, we knew that we needed to be competitive. But we also had learned that there was a lot of problems with the model they had created and that they had exposed their entire internal kind of object model um, to third party developers. And as a result, every time they updated their application or their own, you know, their own kind of object model, um, a lot of plugins were breaking. And so we wanted to be really intentional around what we expose to third party developers, both from the perspective of security, but also from the perspective of like ensuring that they're they're binding to the interfaces that we actually can maintain over time. 
Um, and so, yeah, we explored realms, um, which had some issues at the time. I'm not actually up to speed on where it's at now, just cause we, we don't really need it anymore. But, um, ultimately what the team did, which I think it just, it still sounds so crazy is we basically found a small JavaScript runtime that we could compile, uh, into OASM, you know, executable inside of our, our, uh, address space. And then we expose scripting languages or scripting interfaces. Um, via that runtime, just like you would in developing a game engine, um, and essentially use that embedded JavaScript runtime that's running inside of effectively a JavaScript runtime um, as a sandbox uh, in order to really control what these third-party developers could do um, with with customer files and, and limit access accordingly to, to build trust and ensure that people could install things without worrying too much about it. Um, so yeah, it's it's amazing in retrospect that all of that worked out and that you know, it's as, as fast and performant as it is, but um, yeah, it's, it's credit to the team for really taking their time to look at the solution space and, and pick a pick something pretty bold that uh, ultimately I think contributed a lot to our success over the years.